I'm planning to do a series on the Collective Intelligence Corporation, and this is going to evaluate these 11 different models from the Collective Intelligence Project. But this video is really me setting up what is the frame for that. Because when you first see that list, you might think this is kind of boring, uh, what's the point here, it's all about money. But in some ways, this is actually going to be one of the key battlegrounds over control over artificial intelligence. And if artificial intelligence has the potential to sort of transform the rules of the game in terms of how economics is structured, in terms of how governance is structured, in terms of how we decide what is valid and invalid information, all of that, if that's about to change because artificial intelligence is going to sort of supercharge those processes, then it matters a lot whether there's democratic accountability for the robots. And yet, in this moment in time, we actually do need quite a bit of money to finance artificial intelligence getting up and running. So the question is, how do we finance that without giving too much control to people who want control over the rules of the game for themselves? That's this battleground. And this video, I'm just sort of framing what is the battle we're facing, what are the different players, what are the goals, what are the different models we're going to play around with, and what are the worries that we need to pay attention to as we evaluate these different models for funding artificial intelligence projects that aim for some kind of democratic accountability. That's an overview. Now, let me start with what is the goal here of collective intelligence? And I have another video on what is collective intelligence, but basically there are sort of two parts to the story when you think about applying artificial intelligence to solve problems. And one is the collecting of information and the validating of information, like the sorting of information into valid and invalid categories, or flagging that information, which might be more complicated than valid and invalid, it might have nuances to it, but the collecting of information is one part of the story. And then the second part of the story is how is that information used in practice? to decide what kinds of information to show people, to decide what kinds of credit scores might end up fueling the system, even if we don't know that's happening, that kind of thing. And for both of those parts of the process, we want some form of democratic accountability. And the way I'm representing this on this diagram is we want to move from one dollar one vote in terms of who gets a say about what kinds of artificial intelligence algorithms come on the scene to one person one vote. And I do mean this fairly loosely. Like it may not be the type of vote we're used to where it's once every two years or once every four years we vote. It's going to be something else that might mix a bunch of different systems. But the basic idea is that everybody in society has some kind of say or some kind of avenue for their voices to be heard by the people with the actual decision-making power that are programming artificial intelligence. That's the idea. And also that there's mechanisms such that the decision-makers can't just dismiss people's claim that artificial intelligence is violating their rights or structuring society in an unjust way. That's basically what I mean by democratic accountability. Now, let me set up the players of the game because I like to think of this as really three players with different roles in this battle and in this story. And this is a Lorenz curve. It's the graph that goes along with the Gini coefficient, if you're familiar with that. If you're not, it's not super important. What you need to understand is that these three people sit at different places on the, I'm going to say at first, income distribution, but that's not exactly what it is. It's actually, where do they sit in terms of percentile on their power over money? And of course, power over money is not just about income. It's also about, obviously, wealth. But also things like, uh, are you the head of a corporation that has lots of money that you kind of influence or wield where that money goes? That kind of thing. So we have the person who's purple here, who's sitting at the 30th percentile. And this person basically lives month to month. So they don't have money to invest in any kind of artificial intelligence project. 
And yet, we do want this person to be part of the eventual story in our democratic accountability. On the far end of this diagram, we have the person sitting at the 99.99999, a whole bunch more nines percentile. And in some ways, that's the villain of this story. It's the person who has gotten to their position with hopes that they can use their money and their influence over money to set the rules of the game in their favor. And then we have the blue person who's sitting at the 90th percentile, meaning they actually do have some money to contribute to causes that would move us toward a more pro-social sort of governance of artificial intelligence. But they recognize that there's a problem if these people were to gain too much influence over these systems that were that are evolving. Now, in some ways, when we're talking about the beginning of the story, where we have to finance artificial intelligence somehow, these people, to some degree, are the heroes of the story because they're going to have to contribute their money to causes that will move us in the right direction. Now, of course, they're hoping to bring these people along. And of course, developing mechanisms to give these people a say along the way, that's actually part of how this story will play out. But these people need to use their skills in wielding control over money to sort of collectively come up with something against those people. That's the way I'm framing this battleground. Now, there of course can be collusion both among the blue people, but also among the red people. And if we're thinking about who are the red people in general, I mean, we might imagine the head of a corporation has quite a bit of control over money that they can use, but they're also a little bit accountable to people around them and to other forces. Um, if we think about the head of a corporation that controls people's money, that might be an even more powerful type of head of a corporation. But that red group could also include someone who was, say, the head of a country where the country had a one-party system and they were the dictator, whatnot. So there's actually quite a number of different ways of conceptualizing who might be sitting up here at the very, very tip top. Those are the characters. So what is our battleground here? What is what is the actual thing that we're trying to think about when we're evaluating these models for funding artificial intelligence? And the way I think of it is if these people can recognize that they have shared goals for moving us towards something with a more democratically accountable artificial intelligence, they may want to come together and fund something to make that happen. But the problem is that these red people, they are really good at the skill of wielding money to influence stuff that happens in the world. And they do that both through corporations and through the way they may influence corporations that they have in their network or they have influence over or that they're a customer of, for example. But they may also do this through um, funding sort of pro-social avenues where they come over and they hijack pro-social groups for their own purposes. So I kind of think of this as a chess game where both of these groups of people are actually pretty good at the chess game. They're pretty good at wielding their money for influence in the world. And they're up against each other in this battle over who controls the algorithms behind artificial intelligence. Now, if we're thinking, what are the ways that the, the red people up here can hijack this for their own purposes? There's actually quite a few tools. And I think of part of this as being about a style of judo they may use when they come in and try to hijack pro-social causes. So judo is basically a martial arts that uses people's energy against them. So you might imagine if someone's coming at you, they have this energy and force that's meant to attack you. And in judo, you switch that energy so that it, it moves back on themselves. That's, that's the general idea. And so if these people can come in and look at the... Um, the, the passion and the social dynamic here and use that social dynamic to accomplish a few little things that would set the rules in favor of the red group. That's kind of how this hijacking works. And I think there's lots of different nuances to that. For example, you may have um, one strategy where you watch the landscape of different groups that are bubbling up, that are pro-social, that have 
uh, these visions of democratic accountability, of collective intelligence that would serve the broader population, all of that, you watch the many different groups. And whenever one of those groups starts to gain steam and gain legitimacy in the eyes of the public or in the eyes of powerful people who can fund them even more, that's the moment you would come in and sort of socially engineer them or, you know, have your way in a small way that, that happens to target the exact 0.0001% of what they're doing that would threaten the power of the, the red people here. So that's what I mean by hijack. And if we want a system that protects against that kind of hijack, we're going to need to think about what are the financing mechanisms? Because obviously the hijack can involve people with the money saying, I'm going to pull the rug out from under what you're doing by pulling away my, my money if you don't do X, Y, and Z. Like that's, that's a risk in this whole process. All right, finally, we've got the corporate model and how this relates to this game of chess. They're playing over control over the algorithms. And here we've got the classic corporate model where we have shareholders who own the capital of the business. We've got the board of directors who is intended to hold the CEO and the whole organization accountable to the interests of the shareholders. So accountability goes in this direction in the corporate model. Now, there's going to be some critiques of the corporate model in terms of accountability and the incentive structure here. So I think talking about those is going to be actually pretty important to figuring out this whole dynamic and this whole story. And I'm currently reading this book uh, by John Kenneth Galbraith, The New Industrial State. He has a different framework for understanding the motives and accountability of large corporations, but also the corporate ecosystem. So I think when we're considering accountability, which a lot of this is really about accountability, we need to think of both frameworks for how money moves, how systems accumulate, how systems develop accountability within themselves, all of that needs to come into play. But the basic idea is that we need to look at all of the different ways that these groups use money to accomplish their goals. And there needs to be some kind of structuring of who pays into the system, who gets money out of the system, who has governance rights, how does accountability move within the system. All of those questions need to be evaluated if we want to move from this side of the diagram where there's $1, one vote on artificial intelligence rules to one person, one vote. That's the basic framework for the battleground I'm talking about. So if these models of funding and accountability for collective intelligence corporations sound boring to you initially, I hope you get a sense that this is actually one of the biggest battlefields of the future. 